Okay, great. Okay, aloha everybody and welcome to our April installment of uh, Virtual Third Thursday. My name is Russell Ueno. I'm with uh, the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. Um, and for those of you that are new to us and this is your first time here, welcome. Uh, this is our opportunity to share uh, resources, people that we've worked with, um, all kinds of things and, and, and bring it to a wider audience. Um, so we welcome you um, and we hope you enjoy this. Uh, for those of you that are, um, have been with us before, welcome back. And um, uh, we hope to have another uh, interesting and informative uh, session for you today. Uh, today's topic is the recent research on the impacts and legacy of the 311 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. Uh, we're a little bit late. Um, of course, most a lot of the media coverage of the anniversary, the 10th anniversary happened last month. Um, but we didn't have our third Thursday last month. So, so we're, we're catching up here. And uh, we do have um, a couple of speakers that I think have a, a lot of insight to, to bring to you on, on this um, what is still a, a, a you know, major event. And as we can see, the ramifications uh, are still playing out right now, as, as you all know, um, relating to the disposal of the, uh, the water, the radioactive water. In any event, um, first order of business is, I would like to, um, turn this over briefly to our executive director, Dr. Carl Kim, who has a, a special announcement to make. Carl? It's great to see you all. Uh, you know, we get together once a month uh, to check in on each other virtually, and then also to uh, share information uh, and uh, updates and, 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 and good news uh, as well. Uh, uh, in the past month, we've been very active. Uh, one of our graduate students, Sequoia Riley, uh, presented at the Emerging Scholars uh, Forum, part of our University Transportation Center. Uh, with that University Transportation Center project that we're doing, we also awarded uh, three uh, research grants uh, that use AI, big data, uh, machine vision, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, and some of the other uh, development work that we're doing. So uh, hopefully in time, those will turn into training courses and uh, other applications that we're working on. Um, but we also have really uh, great news to share with you all. Uh, our science director, uh, Professor uh, Bruce Houghton, um, who's the Gordon A. McDonald Professor of uh, Volcanology, here at the University of Hawaii, uh, who is really a world-renowned uh, scholar. Uh, he was recently awarded the highest award, uh, the uh, Cora uh, Rudinson Award uh, in volcanology. Um, and now uh, we've just learned that he's been awarded uh, the Excellence in Research Award uh, from uh, the Board of Regents. And uh, I want to, again, congratulate Bruce on this uh, achievement, but also to really acknowledge and thank him for uh, his many, many years of support uh, of our work uh, in the center uh, and uh, helping um, to build resilience. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Bruce, do you want to say hello and, and, and uh, a few words? You're on mute. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I was I was hiding in the corner because I'm I'm off to Iceland tonight to to chase more eruptions. But um, I thought I'd better appear in part because the image on the screen is is not not typical of me when I'm in Honolulu <laughs> exactly. But it's really a two way thing. It's been great. The the time with the center has really given relevance and salience to the research we do, and it's going to continue. It's, 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 going, it's going to be very, a very, very powerful thing in the future. So thank you, Carl, and thank you, everyone. 
uh, that, that I've worked with. It's, it's great to see you and, and be careful in Iceland. It's a totally different culture, Carl. They let people walk up to the, the front of the lava. <laughs> We've been sending videos to the National Park here from them to, to torment the Park Service in terms of people do, do better here. So, right. yeah, yeah, we, we hope to see uh, some of your firsthand experiences uh, with, with that event as well, too. So, uh, again, uh, um, thank you again, Bruce, for all, all of your. Uh, great work that you do with us. Uh, Russell? Okay, great. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, without further ado, let's go to our first presentation now. Um, and our first presenters are Dr. David Wynn, who is an associate professor at the International Research Institute of Disaster Science at Tohoku University. Uh, you see some other of his um, uh, qualities and, and accolades there. He, um, one of the things that's interesting, of course, is that David is an alumnus of the University of Hawaii and of the Disaster Management and Humanitarian Assistance Program. So it's wonderful to, to welcome David back into the, the fold here. Um, his co-presenter, uh, who is not here yet, but um, uh, may join us in a, in a moment, is Dr. Fumihiko Imamura, and he is the director of the International Research Institute of Disaster Science at Tohoku University, and a, a recognized uh, expert uh, in the field. Um, and he's done much uh, research on um, you know, tsunami warning systems, uh, disaster mitigation measures, and so forth. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me turn it over to David. Okay, thank you very much, Russ, for the introduction. Um, let me just try to share my screen. Okay. All right, can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, let me play from the start. Okay, um, I'll start right now. So uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is David Nguyen. I'm an associate professor at Tokyo University. And I'm also a researcher at the National Research Institute for Earth Science and Disaster Prevention. Um, that's basically the Japanese equivalent of NOAA, more or less. Um, so Professor Imamura and I have created this slide and we're gonna talk about um, the 10 years since the Great East Japan earthquake, and that's what they call it in Japan. And, but before that, I also want to talk about some of the um, history that has led to the hazard exposure and vulnerabilities in the region. Okay, um, so first, a bit of uh, geography. Uh, Tohoku is the northernmost region on Honshu Island, which is the main island in Japan, and it's this yellow region. And it consists of six prefectures, uh, with Miyagi having the largest city in the region, Sendai City. And combined, there's about less than 9 million people, uh, which is one of the more sparsely populated regions in Japan. Uh, in contrast, just Tokyo by itself has 14 million people. So next, I'd like to talk about the hazard exposure in the Tohoku region. So as many of you know, uh, the whole country of Japan is within the Ring of Fire, which is an area of active seismic activity where earthquakes, uh, tsunami, and volcanic eruptions can occur. And basically what is happening is that the Pacific Plate is subducting under the Eurasian Plate. And you also have the Philippine Plate in the south um, going towards the Eurasian Plate. And this is what causes a lot of both inland and offshore earthquakes, and in some cases, tsunamis. In addition to that, there's a lot of hydrometeorological activity in Japan. Um, right south of the islands, that's where the typhoon generating region is. And a lot of these typhoons uh, usually go up north um, into uh, Okinawa, the Kyushu, and Tokyo areas. And uh, from these typhoons, you have heavy rain, landslides, and flooding. And arguably, uh, these heavy rains and landslides are 
probably the most common problem that Japan faces. Okay. So when we look at the hazard situation more locally, uh, Tohoku is no stranger to tsunamis and earthquakes. And uh, researchers categorize the tsunamis in Tohoku into two types of categories. An L1 tsunami, which comes roughly every 100 years, and an L2 tsunami, which is roughly every 1,000 years. So the 2011 um, earthquake is considered an L2 tsunami. And the last L2 tsunami was in eight, 869, the Jogan earthquake. So we are not expecting any L2 tsunamis in the near future. But uh, if you look between them, there are several 100-year interval tsunamis. And so we are expecting another L1 tsunami sometime soon. OK, so I want to talk a little bit about the social economic vulnerabilities prior to the 2011 disasters. Uh, so the Tohoku region is an area that's in decline. Um, around the 80s or 90s, depending on the prefecture, the region's already been experiencing a significant decline in this population. And as a result, the uh, economy is also declining. So in the past, like after World War II, the region, especially Southern Tohoku, was very active industrially. But over time, um, Japan is experiencing this very um, massive agglomeration problem. And if you see in the picture on the bottom corner, most of the population is um, moving into the greater Tokyo area and to a lesser extent, the Nagoya area. And what this leaves behind is all these other prefectures that have only the young and the old. And this creates a really massive problem in terms of uh, vulnerabilities because uh, uh, I'll, I'll mention a little bit more about that in a bit, but um, there is a very significant demographics challenge that's uh, not just Tohoku, but all over Japan outside of the uh, major cities. And what we have is a phenomenon called shutter towns. And what they are is uh, inside every city in Japan, especially in the non-major cities, uh, the downtown area where all the commercial um, businesses are, most of them have shut down. And those that, are, that still survive, they close very early. And so um, this is a very, quite honestly, depressing situation where um, all the cities all over Japan are shutter towns. All right, so next I'd like to talk about the actual disaster events and it's often called triple disasters. Um, and starting with the actual earthquake itself, which happened on March 11 um, at 2.46 p.m. And it was a magnitude 9.0 earthquake and the fourth largest uh, since um, 1900. And within that uh, month, there was over 400 aftershocks. So it was very, very active. What was more damaging was actually the tsunami that was caused as a result of the earthquake. And the largest of which um, reached the uh, coast of Tohoku, Eastern Tohoku within half an hour. And for the next two days, um, there were seven major tsunamis uh, that reached Japan. And if you look in the picture in the bottom corner, that's Miyako City. Uh, and Miyako is no stranger to tsunamis because uh, of the many different uh, tsunamis they had in history. So they've built this very expensive seawall that surrounds the city. But as you can see in this picture, the seawalls did um, very little to stop the waves because it was an L2 tsunami. Uh, so the waves were much higher than the seawall. So it overly, um, easily overcame uh, these walls and inundated the city. In terms of the damage to the, reg the, the largest regional city, which is Sendai, um, unlike the other cities in the Tohoku region, Sendai is actually mostly flat, it's a plain, while the other cities are generally very hilly or mountainous. Um, so there's little um, in terms of natural features to stop the waves uh, sh striking Sendai. So if you look in this picture um, on the bottom right corner, you can see the Sendai International Airport. 
So the airport, um, at least the first floor, got completely inundated. That's how far the uh, tsunami waters reached. And in an interview with the airport authorities, um, it got them completely off guard. And they said that they saw the tsunami coming, but they never thought it would actually reach that far into the airport. So they didn't actually um, prepare um, on time because they actually thought it would stop, but it actually didn't. And then the third disaster is the nuclear incidents. Um, a lot of people know about the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, but not too many people know that another power plant um, in Miyagi prefecture called Onagawa uh, also got affected. Um, fortunately, the flooding didn't reach the reactor building and it was limited to the auxiliary building. But for Fukushima Daiichi, um, a lot of the buildings got flooded and what happened was that uh, power was knocked out. And because the power was knocked out, um, some of the, the reactors had no ability to uh, cool down. And as a result, some of them exploded. The situation could have been much worse, actually, and a much worse uh, scenario could have occurred um, if it wasn't for the heroics of some of the staff. So uh, in order to release some of the buildup, some of the staff risked their lives going to a radioactive area and manually releasing the valve to let out, to allow the venting process to start. Um, so that is what happened in Fukushima. But unfortunately, a lot of radiation did escape and it affected a lot of the uh, coastal towns in Fukushima. Now, in terms of damages, as you can see here, it's not just Tohoku that uh, was damaged. Um, as you can see, the entire Eastern Japan was, um, was affected from Hokkaido all the way to the greater Tokyo area. But most of the deaths and casualties and damages were focused on just three pre uh, prefectures, Iwate, Miyagi, and Fukushima, with over 20,000 deaths or people who are still unaccounted for, and hundreds of thousands of buildings that are um, destroyed or partially damaged, and uh, significant financial damages. And a lot of displacement, especially in the Fukushima area, over 100,000 evacuees from the coast uh, going inland. Although since then, a lot of people have started returning to their towns um, as they are being rebuilt. In terms of uh, visitor numbers, as you can see here, there was a sharp decline in tourism to the eastern um, Tohoku prefectures. And so as a result of this uh, 2011 disasters, the Japanese government tried to revitalize the national economy by changing some of the tourism visa policies. Uh, basically, they were trying to make it easier for tourists to enter Japan, and it was targeted towards Asian countries, especially Korean tourists, Chinese tourists, and etc. And since 2011, um, tourism grew really rapidly across Japan. But as you can see on the chart on the right, it was very um, the benefits were very uneven. So Okinawa, which was uh, comparatively least affected from the disasters, had the biggest increase of tourists, like over 800%. All the other regions were roughly about 200%. And the Tohoku region comparatively um, benefited less uh, from the visa policy changes. Um, although it did grow, it's just catching up to its pre-disaster levels. And likely because of this uh, two years of a COVID pandemic, I think the, the numbers probably went back down to pre-disaster levels, or sorry, back to disaster levels. So in one of our research where we looked at the hotel industries, we interviewed several coastal hotels in the Tohoku region and compared them with another hotel in Ishigaki, which is in Okinawa. And Ishigaki was chosen because it has a similar population size and uh, it also has a very um, significant tsunami risk. And what we discovered was that, generally speaking, the hotels in the Tohoku region, such as in Miyako and Matsushima, were not very prepared for disasters, either, either in terms of information for tourist evacuation sites, uh, stockpiling, um, drills for the staff, and etc. While in contrast, Ishigaki had adopted a lot of different initiatives to help prepare both the hotel and the ability of staff to help tourists, 
um, evacuate during a disaster. And one of the reasons is that um, Ishigaki or Okinawa as a whole is a more advanced tourism economy. And as a result, they have a DMO or destination, destination marketing organization. And Hawaii has one too. It's called um, the Hawaii Tourism Authority. And what this does is that it allows um, improved collaboration between the local governments and the private sector. And so in this case study, uh, Ishigaki had a lot of resources uh, from the local government that helped the local businesses better prepare for the disasters. In contrast, Tohoku didn't have any such things back then. So the private sector was left mostly on its own. And because many of the hotels in Tohoku are owned by family businesses, they didn't have any resources to help uh, prepare for disasters. But since then, um, it seems that the Tohoku region started uh, developing and establishing some of their own DMOs, but they're still at an um, early stage and they haven't even reached the uh, crisis management stage. However, um, aside from the hotels, what actually did work in terms of preparedness was um, evacuation training of school children. So in Iwate Prefecture, despite the heavy um, casualties uh, in the region, in the prefecture, um, there are no school children casualties in Iwate. And a lot of this is due to uh, disaster education and disaster risk awareness. So Iwate, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the prefectures that has a long history of tsunamis. And they would often tell these stories, traditional stories that are passed down by generation to generation. And they would use like a local town bell to ring the bell that would alert um, the local community to evacuate. And nowadays there's more modern technology such as uh, radio and social media. Um, but because of this history, this is what led to um, a lot of school children in Iwate um, being more successful in evacuation. Um, and it was a lot better than the neighboring um, prefecture in Miyagi. Uh, we also did a similar research um, in Hawaii between Hilo and Honolulu. And generally Hilo was much better prepared and because of uh, that stems a lot from Hilo's history with tsunamis, the presence of a tsunami museum uh, and a lot of stories that, that are being passed down from um, relatives who survived in Hilo. And so school children in Hilo were much more aware of the hazard risk and evacuation routes uh, than some of the schools we interviewed in Honolulu. So next I'd like to talk about the rebuilding or reconstruction efforts. And I'll talk about both the structural and non-structural approaches. So in terms of structural approaches, um, a lot of coastal communities in the Tohoku region were mostly or completely destroyed. And, but this does give an opportunity to reconsider how to rebuild uh, these communities. And one, met, one um, planning approach that is being utilized is actually relocating uh, the entire residential areas to less hazardous areas. For example, moving them away from the coast into um, areas of higher elevation, et cetera, uh, moving it further away from L2 tsunami hazard risk areas and et cetera. And so some towns have adopted this approach uh, to re relocate more inland. Another approach is just to modify the existing area and not have so much people moving around. Um, so for example, this would be reconstruct, reconstructing some of the waterways or especially the development of embankments um, around the city, which can help mitigate uh, some of the flooding. And next, there was a lot of, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of displaced people, hundreds of, of thousands of people that are displaced. And so a lot of the construction efforts were focused on new housing for these people, either um, permanent ones or temporary ones. Uh, but unfortunately, even though there's a lot of temporary housing, a lot of the people that are meant to stay there temporarily are still stuck there. And um, this is an, another ongoing issue um, about relocation because there's still people in these temporary housing. Now, next, I'd like to talk about non-structural measures. And uh, Japan is a country that's really famous for its engineering approaches to just about everything. But this earthquake or triple disasters made people realize that 
this uh, engineering or structural approaches has its limitations. And one of the biggest limitations is that it's very expensive to implement. And there's a lot of concerns because the Tohoku region is economically declining. So there's a lot of um, questions about the financial um, sustainability of these projects. So there's a greater interest in non-structural measures. So one is um, strengthening the early warning system, um, such as uh, using more seismometers around the country or sonometers in the oceans. And since 2011, for example, a lot of rail companies started installing seismometers across their infrastructures. And what this allows is, for example, high-speed railway um, conductors to take appropriate action like several minutes before an earthquake actually occurs. And also since then, a lot of um, phones, uh, regardless of the provider, um, now offers um, man um, alert systems that come uh, several minutes before an actual earthquake. And actually in the Tohoku region, uh, we just had two significant earthquakes in February and March. And uh, we get the messages through our phones about two minutes before the earthquake. So we can actually take time to uh, decide what to do and where to move before it actually occurs. Another um, development that's been going on is the use of AI. And I want to go back a little bit to the 1995 disasters in Kobe, which is near Osaka, the Osaka area. And one of the biggest criticisms of the Kobe earthquake was that people took too long to respond. And some people, some uh, government stakeholders didn't even know about the situation until hours after it had occurred and they're watching the news. And so there was a lot of criticism about how long um, it took people to make decisions in 1995. In 2011, uh, there was a lot of improvements. Uh, the local governments could meet much more quickly, but there's a lot of room for improvement on um, exped expediting these uh, decision-making processes. And this is where AI is um, hopefully uh, going to be useful in reducing this time to respond to a disaster and make decisions much more quickly. For example, using it, to analyze tsunami data, also using it to quickly calculate damages and et cetera. So um, the local governments have been um, trying to use AI to help make decisions first easier to understand and then um, help them make uh, delegate some of the commands to the emergency first responders much more quickly. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about Sendai. So as I mentioned earlier, Sendai is relatively very flat and there's no natural method to um, stop these flooding. So what Sendai has been doing is they've been developing a tsunami resistant city that consists of layers, starting with a seawall. But this seawall isn't a very um, tall seawall. It's not designed for an L2 tsunami. It's designed for L1 tsunami that is uh, expected to be the majority of tsunamis the city could face. However, in the case that a larger tsunami does overtop the seawalls, there's a layer of forest that can help mitigate the impact of the tsunami waves. And then you have these red zones and yellow zones where uh, residential um, developments are limited. However, some uh, industrial uh, buildings are allowed. And you also have several embankments um, that actually function as a type of seawall on its own. And because this area is flat and there's no high ground, there's also dedicated evacuation facilities, either new built ones or utilizing existing buildings that are tall enough and strong enough uh, to function as such. And then here you can see uh, more of this planning in the different zones, the evacuation facilities, the housing, et cetera. And then most importantly, there's a, since 2011, there's been a huge spread in hazard signage. And most of them are generally standardized with the same system. And these signages show where the hazard risk areas are, where the evacuation routes are, which building to escape to and et cetera. And in some cities that have a lot of tourists, a lot of these signs are multilingual, uh, either in English or more commonly um, 
Chinese and Korean because Chinese and Koreans are the two largest uh, tourism groups uh, in Japan. In terms of the transportation sector, uh, we interviewed several different rail companies across the country. And generally speaking, the Tohoku rail companies have implemented a lot of different um, preparedness activities to help strengthen how they respond to a disaster. For example, um, dealing with false alerts, presenting more information in the stations or trains, more training for evacuations, and better use of ICT. And one uh, company that was very interesting for me was Sanriku Railways, um, which is in Iwate. And what happened was that they realized the importance of having more autonomous decision-making, allowing train staff and train conductors to, to decide what is best. And the reason for that is because uh, during the 2011 disaster, they actually had a train in operation. And when it was about to enter a tunnel and then the, the, the earthquake happened and the driver decided not to enter the tunnel due to risk of landslide. So he actually drove the train back to an area he knew was high enough and also had enough um, facilities to help evacuate staff or sorry, passengers. And so uh, that was one of the interesting um, examples of uh, autonomous decision-making uh, that train uh, staff did during the disasters. Um, another thing that they're also trying to do, especially JR East in uh, preparing for the Olympics is that they were expecting a surge of foreign tourists into uh, Japan for the Olympics. And if should a disaster were to occur, they wanted to know how to deal with them. And so in the pictures on the bottom right corner, I was invited to JR East to give a series of lectures on how to deal with uh, foreign tourists in the event of a disaster in the Olympics. Uh, but we don't know what's gonna happen now because of the status is really up in the air. And last I heard, uh, there, it seems like they don't wanna open up the Olympics to uh, foreign tourists. They're just gonna keep it domestic, but uh, we'll see. Fukushima compared to the other prefectures are experiencing probably the most ongoing problems and uh, mostly because of uh, the radiation issue. And there's been a lot of misinformation over uh, the Fukushima situation. And one of the problem comes from the name being used, which is just Fukushima, which uh, applies to the whole prefecture. Yet the actual um, incident happened at the Fukushima Daiichi plant, which is in the um, on the coast, which is managed by Tokyo Electric or TEPCO. And a lot of people have kind of criticized why this disaster has been called the Fukushima disaster and not the TEPCO disaster because it's TEPCO's kind of ignoring of hazard information that led to the situation. And most of Fukushima's population actually lives inland, quite far from the coast. And there's a huge mountain range that separates the coastal areas and the nuclear power plant and the rest of Fukushima which is relatively um, unaffected, or I, I should better say that the radiation level is no bigger than any other major city. But despite that, uh, the entire prefecture's products have been banned from a lot of um, different areas uh, across the world. And so this led to a, diff a lot of difficulties for the local industries to recover from the disasters. But despite these bans, one industry in particular, the sake industry, has somehow managed to survive this. And they even won the top sake award in Japan for seven years in a row. And so we researched all the breweries in uh, Fukushima as well as talking to the uh, local government about what they did to counter the, this um, stereotypes. And what we found was really interesting. It was a really ca good case study of um, business, local government, academia, and local community collaboration and what it is, is that the local government would spearhead these initiatives, such as holding hosting events abroad in different countries. And they would invite the local businesses to promote their products, especially the sake industry. So they would go to, for example, France, uh, invite the prime minister, et cetera, and they would serve them Fukushima sake. And from here, they would find new markets to replace the old ones. And most of the old ones are in Asia, which has a strong fear of radiation. And so the, the breweries were able to replace uh, the old markets with new ones. And they also received subsidies from the government to do better research. For example, 
that are researching how to improve the um, brewery process. Another is better farming processes and especially safety processes. And so a lot of the sake being produced in Fukushima go through a much more stricter uh, inspection process and safety process, which results in a product that's actually being considered more safer than the other sake in the rest of the country because it's going through much more stricter processes of um, uh, quality checks and et cetera. And in addition, uh, these breweries are working with the local community. So they try to buy, for example, glass, rice, ropes, or whatever from the local city or whatever they can from the prefecture in order to help keep each other employed. And so this is really interesting on how they work together to support each other. Unfortunately, this only applies based from what I know, the sake industry and some of the other industries such as um, some of the fruits and vegetables coming out of Fukushima are still suffering um, from the, the recovery. So in terms of lessons learned, um, disaster recovery takes years and even decades. And when you go on the internet, you see a lot of these memes of pictures of quick um, reconstruction in Japan, like they rebuilt a road in one or two days. But the reality is that it takes a long time. And going back to the 1995 disaster in Kobe, Kobe was one of Asia's busiest shipping ports, um, or actually one of the world's busiest shipping ports. But because of the, the earthquake in 1995, the port of Kobe went down for a few years. But during those few years, it was down. Other ports in Asia, such as Pusan or Taipei, has surpassed uh, Kobe. And Kobe has never recovered its past um, status as a major port. Um, and so in the Tohoku area, there's, it's already in decline. And there's a lot of worry that it's actually never going to recover. Uh, next is structural mitigation. Um, structural mit mitigation can help reduce the impact of tsunamis and other hazards. But in some cases, they may even create further vulnerabilities. For example, um, I just mentioned earlier that tsunami forests can help mitigate the waves. But if you plant the wrong trees, they're going to get uprooted and actually become a hazard risk. Uh, and that's what happened in some cities. They actually used the wrong trees, and then the trees became battering rams. Another issue is that these seawalls can create a false sense of safety. And that's what happened in Miyako. They felt that because they were safe with the seawall, they didn't restrict development. So you had all these um, businesses that built all the way up to the seawall, and then they got flooded in the 2011 disasters. And some communities don't even want these seawalls. For example, Matsushima, which relies on its tourism and access to the small islands, are strictly opposed to it because it's going to affect tourism. And some other cities, such as uh, Ishinomaki, et cetera, um, that rely heavily on fishing, they're also reluctantly or reluctant in adopting seawalls. And from a financial perspective, they're very expensive to build and also expensive to maintain. So as a result, non-structural mitigation can be more cost-effective in the long term. Uh, improvements in disaster education, uh, zoning and other regulations, stockpiling, um, evacuation drills and training, etc. And this also highlighted the need for a better planning approach in Japan. And as I mentioned, Japan, uh, sorry, as I mentioned before, Japan is a very top down um, planning approach that's very hev heavily based on engineering approaches. But 2011 um, made a lot of local governments realize that it needs to be more inclusive. You need uh, the local community to explain how they're using the area on their everyday use, the considerations of the, in the environment, the attractiveness of the scenery, in addition to um, engineering ideas. And so there's been a greater interest in more bottom-up approaches uh, since 2011. Uh, so I, I'd like to conclude um, about talking about some of the ongoing issues. So there is still an ongoing economic and demographics decline in the Tohoku region. And it's not only the Fukushima evacuees, but it's all over the region. After 2011, a lot of people felt the region was unsafe and there's little opportunity. So a lot of people I know have uh, migrated uh, outside of the entire region to like the greater Tokyo area or the Kansai area, et cetera. 
And of course, as I mentioned, Fukushima still has this long-term issue of this negative stigma over radiation, a lot of misinformation. And as many cities are rebuilding, there's also a lot of discussion or debate about how it should rebuild. And you generally have two camps. You have one side that's promoting a compact city. And so uh, people who support the compact city idea are taking into consideration that the cities are gonna shrink and shrink in population size, and it's gonna be older or very young. And because you have these vulnerable populations, they're suggesting that the, city, the cities should be smaller so that the elderly don't need to rely on transportation as much and everything could be more walkable for them. However, those um, who oppose it argue that building such a city is basically keeping all your eggs in one basket. And so you have these two, these two camps and even within our institution in um, Tokyo University, there's a lot of people split between this and there's no right or wrong answer. There's just um, focusing on different aspects. Um, for me personally, I lean towards uh, the compact city, um, but for example, some of my other colleagues um, are against that. Another issue is maintaining disaster risk awareness. And this is an issue that is um, being experienced everywhere. So right now this disaster is still fresh in our minds. So we know what to do um, in the future, but as generations pass, people are gonna begin forgetting and how to maintain this risk awareness becomes a challenge. And this is where uh, you should build um, monuments or some kind of memorials, et cetera, to help maintain this risk awareness. And finally, a decline in reconstruction funding. And uh, Japan tends to think in like five or 10 year terms and Tohoku just passed 10 years. And so there's been a significant cut in reconstruction, yet there are still ongoing issues. So for a lot of people dealing with these ongoing issues, now the issue is how to find the, the money to um, continue this recovery and reconstruction processes. Okay, so I'd like to conclude uh, my presentation. Thank you for listening. I think I went over time. Uh, this is a picture of Onagawa, which actually rebuilt. So this is like a new community area uh, that's trying to be more compact that I mentioned earlier. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, let's move quickly then to our next speaker, Dr. Miyoshi Numada. He is the Associate Professor at the Institute of Industrial Science at the University of Tokyo. Um, Dr. Numada's research has been looking at um, disaster management process engineering, and he's, he's taken a look at these uh, post-disaster activities and, and trying to integrate that into um, disaster comprehensive management plans. Um, and has taken a look at or pioneered a business operating support system or BOSS, um, very interesting system there. Anyway, um, uh, Dr. Numara, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, now, the David explained about comprehensive uh, research of Tohoku. So now I, I want to focus on the uh, post uh, disaster management. Uh, mainly my research topic is disaster management process approach. Okay, so okay, so my, uh, my research approach is uh, research for the uh, disaster risk reduction by the engineering and social uh, science. And I, I wanna focus on the domestic and the international uh, process-based approach. So this photo is a uh, JICA project in Myanmar, and this is a World Bank project uh, in Sri Lanka. Based on the, this research, so now I want to provide training program for the uh, municipality, uh, business people, and community people. And uh, based on uh, this activity, I want to contribute to the real uh, disaster. So then now we manage disaster management training center. So this uh, content training program is uh, awareness and uh, performance and uh, decision making and planning. So now this photo is uh, community people uh, study how to perform, how to operate EOC. 
So th this photo is uh, how to manage uh, uh, shelter evacuation place, so how, how to receive the people based on the, this process. So now we develop a, a virtual reality and uh, online campus, this is e-learning. So now we develop a training tools. Okay, so this is one of the example uh, by the NHK National Broadcast TV. So now we use a school. So now here is no children. That's why this school is uh, any more used. So this is a how to manage garbage, how to collaborate with the construction company and the community people and the local government. So now they are the business people and how, how to use drone and how, how to manage these traffic programs. So then we, we ask the people, local people, how, how to how to recover the road network. So now we provide like this practical uh, training. And uh, international activity, I, I want to apply this Japanese knowledge to the Asian countries. Now this, this movie is in uh, Myanmar. Now they, they, they are the central government staff. Now they discuss about how to uh, respond to the disaster. Now they discuss what is the ideal process. Okay, so now uh, my uh, future planning is now we want to construct a disaster management training center in all over the Japan. And now I want to develop a research, the international uh, educational pro training program. So I, I visit uh, in the PTC, now here is uh, uh, Russell. So I, I ask him how to uh, create, how to develop the training program in America. I study a lot from him. So when I, uh, when Tohoku disaster occurred, I was in the Kanagawa prefecture. So then just after Tohoku disaster, I was in EOC in Kanagawa prefecture. So I asked to the uh, deputy uh, governor of Kanagawa prefecture, uh, what we have to, what we should do now. Then he said, important to take an initiative even if the information is not complete. And also there is a limit to grasp the situation at the site. The staff is in the process of correcting information and necessary to quick grasp and respond to damage situation. And the system, so we, we need a system to manage the comprehensive disaster management. So he, he said about this one uh, around 10 years ago. So how we can achieve this uh, question but after the Tohoku disaster, there are so many uh, natural disasters. This photo is a flood uh, response. This is uh, one of the city. So this photo is a EOC. So, but it's very difficult to manage by the uh, local government. So then how to support, how to research about, how to change this situation. So then now I research based on the process based. Now we have uh, so many past experience uh, from the Kobe, Toho, Kumamoto, Heavy Rain, the others. So how we can use this past experience. So now we have a lot of data, but how we can this uh, experience to the wisdom and to the systemize. So then what is a critical problem in Japan is no this SOP. So now we, now I focus on this SOP. Now we wanna uh, make a disaster standard framework, basic principle. Based on this basic pr principle, uh, we, we can develop ICT, AI or database, some systems. Then uh, we can provide a practical training program, then real response and how we can collaborate with international people. 
Now I want to uh, develop, make uh, this very basic principle for the disaster management in Japan. So I uh, research what they, what the local government respond. So this is a research about uh, Ishinomaki city for Tohoku disaster. Uh, this is also Fukushima uh, prefecture, Ayabuki town, how they, what they respond to the Tohoku disaster. And this is the uh, Kumamoto earthquake 2016. So how they respond. And this is the uh, Joso is a heavy rain uh, case, what they respond. So I, I research what they did. Then finally, now I, I make uh, this uh, framework for the seven kind, kinds of the disaster response framework. So this is a very, uh, one of the basic uh, framework for the Japanese disaster management. Now I, I just put some example, waste management, logistic, medical evacuation, dead body and road network and the EOC management information system. So then based on this, this uh, research, now we develop uh, this system. So this is a named boss, business operation support system. So now we create this flowchart. This is a basic uh, flowchart. So then uh, government or community people understand what is a, a comprehensive or total uh, disaster management activities. Then for example, if you click this one, you can see the more detailed flowchart. Uh, this is a hazard attack and this is a time phase. So then what we should do uh, just after hazard attack. So you can see that you can check details and we, uh, we can link jump to the uh, uh, local government uh, management plan. And there, there are so many guidelines, manual, in Japanese local government. So that's why uh, we can make a link to the necessary uh, document. Then you can understand what is the necessary document, what we should check, uh, manual or report. This is a, a co concept of the this boss system. They, of course, we can uh, search, search and uh, uh, you can understand what is the necessary actions. Okay, so now uh, in this COVID-19, so now we can uh, uh, we can share the all Japanese uh, local government people. Uh, normally, once a month, we have this meeting to make a standard and idea of flowchart for shelter management, for building damage, for road network, for something like this. So th this is now I want to compile all Japanese knowledge. So then after that, we can provide this training. What is the idea of response? This is a prefecture level and local city or village level. So they collaborate what is the necessary uh, response activities. So now we can share this uh, intelligent uh, database by this system. So this is this is the actual uh, heavy rain disaster response case in Kumamoto Prefecture uh, last last year. They, this is the EOC in Kumamoto Prefecture. So there are so many people how how we uh, respond to the next. Then based on this uh, meeting, uh, this system, this both system can show what do you, you need to respond? Then now this yellow mean the now already started, but red, red activity is not started. So the next, what we should do? Uh, now EOC discuss based on the, uh, this both system for the next actions. And uh, now we, uh, last year we did an experiment, experiment if we can use this kind of flowchart system, well, no, uh, this system, just conventional paper mania, only this uh, conventional paper mania. What is different? We can use both system or no, uh, this system, only paper mania. Uh, we check what is the uh, uh, difference. Okay. Okay, so this uh, left, this movie is both team with system and 
uh, right hand is no system, just only a paper-based manual. What is the difference? So then, uh, th this is uh, this experiment is uh, management of shelter. So now, okay. Now this boss system, th he is a leader of this team. He instruct the members, please do this one, please do this one. Next, please uh, prepare this one based on the, this system. On the other hand, uh, this paper manual team is no instruction from the reader. Now they, he is a reader. He cannot instruct to the team members, please do this one, this one. So he, Leader did uh, a lot of activities by, by himself. He cannot uh, control, control the teams. This is one case. And so now we, this experiment, uh, each team uh, report to the EOC, the situation. So this is the EOC. So the EOC get the information from the uh, team and he, he make a record in the time histories. And EOC also share the activities, uh, what is uh, the progress of this response. So EOC can also understand the situation in both team. This is uh, one, one of the, uh, this effect of system. <clears throat> so the, the, this is a time chart, a gun chart. So this uh, up Upper figure show the manual team and bottom one is boss team. So th this is a, a reader and member A, B, reader C, D. So what they did. So orange show the uh, duplicate. Now they uh, collaborate, uh, work together with other members. And gray show the waiting time. Waiting means no instruction from the reader. That's why they don't understand what, what, we, what I should do. So we compare this manual team and boss team uh, no, almost no waiting time for the boss team, but a manual team, a member waited from the instruction from the reader. Okay, so now this is uh, uh, some figures. So waiting time, it's uh, boss team is no uh, very less waiting time. And how many walks uh, compared manual team, boss team? Uh, finally, the boss team uh, did uh, more activities than the manual team. And uh, this, this figure show the time or time difference number of staffs. So this means one, one is uh, individual activity uh, did in both team because the uh, leader instruct each members. Okay, so now uh, quickly I explain about uh, this uh, rec recent activities. Now I just focus on the this damage assessment and response recovery this phase. But uh, now we should research how to mitigate, how to prepare uh, to the next uh, future disaster based on the ex experience of Tohoku disaster. Now David explained uh, like like here recovery or reconstruction. But now we how we can how we research for the next uh, Tokyo uh, disaster or Nankai or potential uh, disasters by the mitigation preparedness. This, this is uh, more important. Okay, so then uh, next step. So how we can uh, use this uh, process-based approach. If we can get a hazard input and calculate damage assessment by the fragility functions, and what kind of response, how many people, uh, resources we need. This is a, a response management and impact e economic and politics, finance, industry, culture, impact analysis. This is a comprehensive uh, development of the system is needed for the uh, next in the future. So this is one of the example. So this is a uh, young one. Uh, this is developed by the JICA project. Okay, now I, generate earthquake here, a magnitude seven and the depth is 50 uh, kilometer. So now calculate the PGA peak ground acceleration. Okay, so now this I generate earthquake here. So here is a very high 
uh, PGA. So then now you, you understand which, this is a city names, local government. And this graph shows that how many building uh, impact. Then you, uh, if you click uh, this uh, damage, then you can understand how many days injured, debris, evacuate. What is the impact of damage? Then after that, how many uh, human resources we need uh, for the response? How many team we need? Then you can uh, calculate how many days we need if we increase the number of teams, this uh, total period is shortened. So now uh, this is one of the example of the comprehensive uh, system from the hazard, approach, hazard attack to the uh, impact analysis. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. I, I just explained very quick, uh, explain about our recent research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Numada. Um, thanks to both of you. I think you know the um, the tape. One of the takeaways here is that as much as we saw uh, last month or, um, through the media and um, about the the ten year anniversary and the impacts and all that. Um, it's amazing to see the, the research and, and um, the depth of the research going on to, to learn from, from this disaster and the other ones that both, um, both of our presenters have, have um, highlighted here. Um, so thank you to both of you. I mean, that's really eye-opening, I think, for, for those of us who are less familiar with that system of emergency management um, and, and patterns of response and all that to, to see that, that that's really enlightening. Okay, um, well, we're going to just, normally we, we break up, but uh, I think uh, given the topics and, and the relationship between these two, we'll, we'll just go ahead and, and stay in the large group. For those of you that have um, questions for our presenters, uh, please feel free, we can take them either in the chat or um, just go ahead and, and uh, unmute yourself and, and ask questions. Okay. I wanted to uh, thank uh, both of our presenters for uh, really excellent uh, presentations. Uh, David, it's, it's, uh, it's really impressive to see the work that you've been doing since you've, uh, since you've left Hawaii. I, I, I can't believe how much you've actually been able to accomplish and uh, and it's, it's really great to uh, see the work that you're doing, uh, the research that you're doing. Uh, we have many of our uh, DMHA students that are uh, uh, watching the presentation, and I think you're uh, a good example. And I, and I hope that you can also please pass on our regards to uh, Professor uh, Imamura uh, and our many other colleagues that we've worked with at uh, Iridis over the years. So. It's really great to uh, see your see your work, and 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 one of the big takeaways that uh, I think is important is uh, is this importance of um, a holistic or systemic, uh, multi-layered uh, way of thinking about this, and I think that that feeds into our really our second presentation um, with, um, uh, with with Professor Numada, uh, which again I think it fits squarely in terms of the work that we're trying to do at the center in terms of trying to understand different events, different types of hazards, different types of communities, different types of capabilities. And I think your approach of uh, really breaking down this into both the uh, preparedness and the response and recovery uh, aspects, I think is, is really important and will give us lots to uh, think about. So I wanna thank you for sharing uh, your very interesting work with us and hope that we can kind of continue to uh, engage on this. I'm sure there are other questions or comments uh, from others in, in the group uh, watching both of these really excellent presentations.